What's up everybody? I'm Alex. I'm Marco. And you are watching Vaga Brothers. And in this episode, we'll be exploring one of the most unique places on Earth, the Aral Sea. We spent the last week traveling to the Silk Road cities of Uzbekistan, and they were all beautiful. But now we're traveling to the northwestern corner of the country to experience one of the worst ecological disasters on Earth. The Aral Sea was once the fourth largest inland sea. Now, it's a giant desert bed full of rusting ships and broken dreams. What happened? To find out, we're hopping in these trucks and driving the last stretch of the road from Nukos all the way to the water's edge. You're watching Vaga Brothers, and this is the journey to the Aral Sea. Well, we have been driving for essentially the entire day. We left uh, Kiva at 7 a.m. this morning. We drove to Nokus, switched vehicles into four x four vehicles, and now we have just arrived to Moinak. This is essentially kind of the end of the road. It used to be right on the water. It's no longer right on the water, but we're staying at a little guest house. We're gonna get some food, kind of get a lay of the land, and then uh, go and take a look at the ship graveyard. Okay, so we're sitting down to lunch right here. We got um, some pickled food, some stew with lamb and potatoes, and some tea. This house belongs to a family that used to work in the fishing industry, but like a lot of the local population, without that industry here, they're pivoting towards tourism. We've been looking on you know, Google Maps to just try to put into perspective where we are, because we're kind of at the convergence of all of the stands. Uh, but we're in a place, it's called the Autonomous Republic of Karakal, Pakistan, which means the land of the men in the black hats. And if you do look on the map, it's pretty incredible because we are like smack dab in the middle of Central Asia. I'm standing now at what used to be the bottom of the Aral Sea. There used to be a hundred ships here, but the mayor cleaned up the place and sold the rest for scrap metal. So there's only about 10 that remain right here. But this is really a surreal experience uh, because the water used to be going as far back as you can see. And now it's this kind of bizarre playground. But to answer our question about how the Aral Sea disappeared in just a few decades, we have to start with the story of the American Civil War. The story of how these ships became marooned 100 kilometers from the Aral Sea starts with the American Civil War. During the Industrial Revolution, the United States grew rich on cotton grown in the South, picked by slave labor, and sold to European textile industry for a very high price. But when the American Civil War broke out, the supply was cut off and Europeans had to find a new supplier of cotton. In stepped the Russian Tsars, who saw the perfect opportunity to fill the gap in the market with their newly conquered lands in Central Asia, which could be perfect for growing cotton if only they could get water into the desert. So, they diverted some of the rivers flowing into the Aral Sea without too much of an impact on the environment. After the Communist Revolution, Lenin advocated for turning the area into a self-sufficient cotton belt of the Soviet Union, saying, irrigation will do more to revive the area and regenerate it and make the transition to socialism more certain. And it worked for a while. In the 1930s, Uzbekistan was exporting cotton worldwide and the area prospered. There were plenty of fish in the sea. Tourists actually came and visited the beaches here. And the Soviet Union was the world's leading cotton producer with over 70% of it coming from Uzbekistan, 
irrigated by the rivers that flowed into the Aral Sea. Then in the 1950s, the Soviet government attempted an overly ambitious irrigation project that tipped the ecological scales too far. Between 1960 and 1980, the water levels here dropped 20 full meters, leaving the Moynak fishing fleet marooned and leaving the remaining seawater so salty that all the fish died. By 1984, industry in the area had dried up just like the lake, leaving Moynak and his fishing fleet a ghost town. It's just really hard to imagine that this was floating at one time and that where we're standing was a body of water. All right, well now we have uh, swung over to the museum, the ecological museum, just to see what used to be here. So here behind me are some images from NASA that show how the sea has dried up over the years. Um, as you can see, it not only shrinks in size, but also color. It's actually 100,000 tons of salt that's been mixed up with all the chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides that they used in irrigating uh, the cotton fields that have made it basically poisonous and that goes up in the atmosphere and has been spread all the way around the world. We are on a mission to get a bottle of vodka to go with dinner because um, it's cold and there's not a lot to do in ways of entertainment out here. So vodka will have to check all the boxes. It's cold as hell. We are here in the middle of December. So it's a very, very uh, cold time of year. There's no clouds in the sky. So there's really not that much heat trapped here. It's gonna be, it's gonna get dark fast. Stay dark until about eight o'clock in the morning. So um, you can tell why places like this have a problem sometimes with drinking because it's one of the only things you can do out here, so. Well, it is 8, 18 in the morning. It's minus eight degrees Celsius outside. And we've piled back into the cars and we're leaving Moignac. Uh, and we're going to be essentially driving into what was once the Aral Sea. Uh, the goal today is to reach what's left of the sea. It's over 100 kilometers away. finished driving across the bottom of the basin and came up this mountain and it just gives some perspective on how much water has vanished because at the bottom of the basin we were 60 meters underwater and now even coming up top we still would be underwater yeah it's insane to think that like this landscape when you look at it now you could never imagine that there was water here ever um, but to to know that there were, you know, over a hundred, there was over a hundred feet of water, uh, is just pretty mind-boggling. Cause there's nothing out in here now. Like we've seen, you know, a skull of like a bull on the side of the road. We've seen like a flock of birds, and that's pretty much it. When you think about it, it's really not that different than um, 
you know, like the Grand Canyon or some other places in the United States that used to be underneath an ocean. It's just that it happened so much faster and it happened directly because of mankind. And you can see, I found this on the bottom of the ground over there. And this is something that, you know, you find in other parts of the world that used to be under the ocean. But in those other places, the ocean was there, you know, around the time of the dinosaurs, like hundreds of millions of years ago. And here it's only 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Like our driver uh, was saying that when he was a kid, he used to come out here and go swimming uh, back at the fishing village we used to be at. And locals there definitely remember it being a normal port. And yet now it's so far from that. Now we're starting to climb up into like a plateau. You can see geologically like lots of like levels of sediment that's been deposited over, you know, the millennia. But we're gonna continue driving. Supposedly we're gonna go into some canyons and then eventually into what's left of the sea. This behind me is what's left of the Aral Sea. It's now one-tenth of the size that it once was. Originally the fourth largest inland sea in the world. The situation today is not looking good. In order to fix this problem, they would have to stop producing cotton here in Uzbekistan, which is a major part of the economy, and it does not look like that's gonna happen. Without diverting water away from cotton production, most experts believe that the sea will dry up entirely by 2025. The sand that's left here is toxic, it's going up into the air and spreading across the entire atmosphere throughout the world and locals here have a higher rate of cancer, tuberculosis, and anemia because of the pesticides used in growing cotton. Well, we've made it to the water's edge and the first thing that I've noticed is the smell. It smells pretty bad. Like it's salty, super salty smell, but also kind of like, like what it smells like when you, something's dying and like decomposing. There's also this really large like gyrating foam. There's just foam coming off the edge of, of the sea. I've never really seen anything quite like it. It's, it's very bizarre. We've made it. We're here at the edge of what's left of the Aral Sea, and I feel sad. I feel really, I feel really sad. I mean, this is like, I love the ocean. I love lakes, I love water. And to see the magnitude and the scale of this environmental catastrophe, and to be on the edge of what's left of this lake and smell it, it smells so bad. And it's crazy, it's all done by man, you know? It really puts a lot of stuff into perspective nowadays. Yeah, you can see the satellite photos show how much the lake has receded. This is really the only part that's left. I think as the first place that I've really been to as kind of a dark tourism theme, I think it's weird to come to a place and, and, and kind of be looking at someone else's situation and be able to be here for a day and then leave but I think it makes you empathetic for, for the people who live here. And it's also a situation I think that affects everyone. When we drove in here, there were these two like handmade airplanes that were kind of hobbled together from pieces of driftwood and a nail, and then kind of like planted into the earth. I just found those planes like really symbolic. Like whoever made those, was dreaming of hopping on an airplane and leaving this place. And I just feel really humble and lucky to be able to do that. But it's a crazy place to wrap up our time here in Uzbekistan because this is like so different than the rest of our trip. We have seen some beautiful places. Uzbekistan is a lovely country. We've gone to some historic cities. And I think the theme that you see in, a, in this part of the world is that it's a place where you see empires come and fall. and you know, we've seen the high point 
of civilizations like in Samarkand, the Silk Road cities and the Timurid Empire and the Greeks and everything like that. And then you see the low watermark of civilizations and in a way this is really the low watermark of the Soviet ambitions and trying to build mass um, a prosperous region here and then seeing those plants collapse into this. Honestly I have enjoyed my time here in Uzbekistan. I think that this is a, a part of the world that gets overlooked quite often and um, I, I doubt most people watching this would be able to find Uzbekistan on a map if uh, given an opportunity. It's been an interesting trip. It's one of like highs and lows, just like you said. You know, we, we're you know at a lowest point right now, but we're ending it on a high. I, I think that it has a ton to offer. This country is beautiful. The people are really friendly, um, and they're genuinely interested in why you're here. They want to. They want to engage with you. They want to know where you're from. They want to pour they you wanna, a shot of vodka. They want to pour you a shot of vodka <laughs> and take a selfie. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that this country has so much to offer. This is a place for the traveler that really wants to step out of their comfort zone and take the path less traveled. We should mention that it's very safe. There is not any concern of cons uh, security. And it's a really interesting part way to access a lot of history and also the culture of the Islamic world. So what was your favorite place that we went to on this trip? I really liked, obviously the Registan and Samarkand was beautiful, um, but I, I really enjoyed Bukhara. I found, I found Bukhara to just be super interesting. It felt like kind of Assassin's Creed and then being able to climb up to the top of the minaret. Uh, that was like a once in a lifetime experience. I don't think many people have done that and I don't think many people are allowed to do that and somehow we we got the golden ticket and we're allowed in there and I really enjoyed that. The food has been delicious. All of the like minced meat kebabs and the soups and the stews. I really enjoyed uh, the Shah Zinda in Samarkand. I thought that was really beautiful. Just the different types of architecture in a small spot. Uh, just seeing all the geometric designs, like for me, like really appreciating the architecture here. And um, just going through the markets everywhere was just such an interesting insight into like the Silk Road and all that culture that really brought the East and West together. And I think my favorite moment was probably having dinner on Hanukkah with the Bukhari Jewish community. I think that was just like such a historic community that you know you see more in the United States in, in the diaspora and people emigrating from here to, to the United States but to go back to a place that's been there like a community that's been there since a thousand BC was really interesting and to have a meal with everyone on such a high holy day was was quite an experience. I'd say on that note if you guys enjoyed this video please give it a big thumbs up you know what to do hit that subscribe button if you have not already and in the meantime stay curious keep exploring and we'll see you guys on the road. Peace. Peace.